Edwards. As News 8's David Goffertson reports, building a family tree, detectives were able to identify the victim whose dismembered body was found inside a dumpster in 2003. When they arrived, they found a pair of women's legs in the dumpster. It was a gruesome scene in Rancho San Diego on October 5th, 2003. Body parts found in a dumpster. The medical examiner conducted an autopsy and determined the legs were that of an adult female. The victim remained unidentified for years until the San Diego County Sheriff's Department started comparing DNA from the body parts to DNA that had been uploaded to a publicly available family tree database. I then got a familial match of somebody who's related but very distant, third or fourth cousin away. For six months, Detective Troy Dugal tracked the victim's family tree from the 1800s to present day when he finally identified the victim's son. DNA testing confirmed the murdered woman was 54-year-old Lori Diane Potter. Lori was never reported as a missing person. This case would have unlikely to have ever been solved without the use of investigative genetic genealogy. Once Potter was identified, they used old-fashioned detective work to identify a suspect. The woman's husband, 68-year-old Jack Potter, was arrested Wednesday at his home in Rancho Cucamonga. We uh, determined that there was a substantial cause uh, to believe that Jack Potter had murdered Lori Potter. The homicide team commended the public for their help in the investigation as distant family members agreed to have their DNA tested to identify the victim. In this case, because it was a victim, very easy, because if I call you and I say, I need your help, your family member was victimized, they're on it. The family members never knew for sure Lori Potter was deceased, but now at least they have some closure. It's a bittersweet, but it's happiness almost across the board. Investigative genetic genealogy, it's the same technique they used to track down the Golden State Killer, except for in this case, they used it to identify the victim, not the suspect. Carlo? David, incredible work on the part of those cold case detectives. Uh, what other cases are they using this genetic genealogy testing for? Any other homicide cases we know of? Uh, yes, we don't know the particular cases, of, co of course, but at the news conference today, the detectives said they have four detectives in the cold case unit in the sheriff's department, and they're using genetic genealogy in about four to five of those cases where the murderer has not been, uh, been identified. Some answers and some closure for families that have been waiting a long time. David Goffertson reporting live. Thanks, David. We have new details tonight about a homicide investigation in Blossom Valley. The sheriff's office says they responded to reports of gunshots around 1.30 this morning in the 10,000 block of Circa Valle Verde, just east of Lakeside. They arrived to find a body outside a granny flat on the property. There is evidence a gun was fired on the scene, but investigators have not confirmed whether the man died from a gunshot. There are no outstanding suspects. An autopsy will take place tomorrow. Tonight, we are hearing from a man at the center of a controversial arrest this week. Cell phone video shows San Diego police officers punching him during an arrest in La Jolla. That sparked a protest today and police investigation. News 8's Heather Hope has the details. Supporters here are demanding answers from police. They're calling for accountability from city leaders, and they want the dispatcher's audio to be released. I hope that I'm the last victim of such activity. Speaking with a Band-Aid on his cheek and with an injury to his eye, Jesse Evans shares what he says happened to him while he was physically arrested by San Diego police Wednesday morning. The true story is I didn't even get to pee because they came around the corner. I unclipped my pants and was going to pee anyway. And like, you can't pee right here. Somebody on decent exposure. Stop! Nicole Banzel shouted as police arrested Jesse and recorded the video she says got too violent. I think it was an excessive use of force. A statement from San Diego Police Wednesday reads in part two San Diego police officers on patrol on Torrey Pines Road witness a man urinating in public. The officers decided to approach the man because urinating in public violates the law. The man would not stop to speak with officers. An officer held the man to detain him despite officers repeatedly telling him to stop resisting. The man would not comply. One of the officers struck the man several times. Because it's ridiculous to me that like an animal, a dog can lift their leg and pee, but if I got to pee bad, 
If I feel like I gotta pee, I can't go find a, a spot out the way and go pee. Shane Harris of People's Association of Justice Advocates led the rally in support of Jesse, calling on the San Diego Police Chief to release body-worn camera footage and dispatcher audio. What we are looking at today is urinating while black. Jesse was taken to the hospital and booked into county jail for resisting arrest and battery on a police officer. Abel Bell Bonds paid Jesse's bail, and Amy Zamudio says she picked Jesse up from jail. Jesse was looking for a restroom. Zamudio says the real issue is the lack of restrooms in the beach community. It is time for real solutions, and it is time for getting police out of the homelessness business. They are making things worse. SDPD Internal Affairs is currently investigating and reviewing body-worn camera video. When they approach our unsheltered citizens, they need to be finding hotel rooms for them instead of putting handcuffs on them. Everyone in the UCSD community was so heartbroken because we all know Jesse. We see him every day when we're coming to school. Heather Hope, News 8. Mayor Todd Gloria has responded tonight, saying in part, quote, use of force should always be a last resort, and whenever it is used, it must be thoroughly reviewed to ensure officers are held accountable for following policy and their training. Tonight, the FAA is investigating an incident that could have led to a disaster at San Diego International Airport. In a statement, the FAA says air traffic controllers instructed the crew of SkyWest Flight 3346 to discontinue their approach last night because another aircraft was on the runway getting ready to take off. The other aircraft, Delta Airlines Flight 2249, did depart safely, and the SkyWest aircraft landed a little later. Tonight, county officials are reporting 261 new COVID-19 cases. That's about 2% of the latest nearly 15,000 tests. The number of people in the hospital with coronavirus-related complications went up by two for a total of 136. ICU patients with COVID increased by one for a total of 40. So far, more than 1.76 million San Diegans have received at least one dose of the vaccine, and more than 1.3 million are fully vaccinated. Governor Gavin Newsom submitted his historic $100 billion California comeback plan today. As he addressed the legislature, he thanked Californians for meeting the moment during the pandemic and setting the state up for a brighter long-term future. Uh, not just a comeback, but an extraordinary decade, uh, arguably century ahead. It's not lost on me when I reflect upon The state now has $75.5 billion in surplus money, and Newsom's budget is fully one-third larger than the current budget. His plan includes stimulus payments, free pre-K for all four-year-olds, and $1.5 billion for small businesses. Lawmakers have until mid-June to consider this plan. Investigators are underway tonight into what caused a house fire in El Cajon. It happened just before 6 this morning on Random Road, south of Chase Avenue. Flames tore through the home, and it was a frightening scene for neighbors. Then I opened my curtains, and I see lots of lights, and then I saw a big fire truck. So then I go running down the hall, and I see my mom, and she says that there is a fire on the next door house. And I got really scared because I didn't know how close it was. There were no reports of injuries. We're told that home may have been abandoned. Many of us have our children on our health insurance plans, but what about our parents? A California lawmaker is pushing a bill that would require private health plans to extend coverage to some subscribers' parents. News 8's Shannon Handy has more on the bill and what both supporters and opponents are saying about it. Shannon? It's called AB 570. If passed, it will allow people who claim their parent as a dependent on their taxes to add them to their health insurance plans, making California the first state to do so. It's a very real problem. About 20 years ago, Nancy Maldonado, CEO of the Chicano Federation, paid out of pocket to insure her parents after they both became self-employed. And even then, it was very expensive. I remember paying well over $1,000 a month to, to ensure that they had health insurance, and that was bare bones health insurance. At the time, they only had green cards, which meant they did not qualify for Medi-Cal. Currently, that's still an issue for tens of thousands of California residents. That's where Assembly Bill 570 comes in. Provided an additional option for families 
that may not have access to these different other safety net programs. California we, Insurance Commissioner the, Ricardo Lara is the bill sponsor. It was written by Assemblyman Miguel Santiago, a Democrat from Los Angeles. If passed, it would require private health plans regulated by the state to extend coverage to some subscribers' parents, specifically those who claim a parent as a dependent on their taxes. We're not basing it on any age requirement for dependent parents, but rather uh, whether the parents meet the definition of a qualified relative under federal law. That means parents who live out of state could potentially qualify. Laura says the bill eliminates expensive individual plans and saves lives, noting a lot of uninsured seniors don't seek medical care until it's too late, including those who died from COVID-19. These people are already here. They're working and contributing. Let's make sure that they have access to care because you know, Shannon, if we don't, where do they end up accessing care? In our emergency room, which ends up costing us three times the amount. But opponents worry the bill could drive up insurance premiums. Not only that, some might take advantage by claiming their parents just to cover expensive procedures. While the exact number is unknown, Lara argues AB 570 only caters to a small percentage of people. For Nancy Maldonado, that's enough to make a difference. This is something that's going to benefit all of us, so why wouldn't we move this forward? AB 570 has passed the Assembly Health Committee. It now moves on to the Senate Appropriations Committee, but will have to go through several more steps before becoming law, which could happen as early as 2022.